Greetings and welcome. We are in uh, Senior AP English and our objective now for the hour is to introduce with just a few minutes the work of the great poet, British poet and novelist D.H. Lawrence and that's where we will begin. We'll begin with some biography information. I wish we had more time. We could talk about this really, really influential uh, uh, writer uh, but we just don't. So we're, we'll, we'll go right to the uh, story that we're studying uh, Rocking Horse Winter in a second. What makes Lawrence so important? Well, Lawrence, like most of the writers we've been talking about, heavily, heavily influenced by the work of Freud. Heavily influenced by the work of Freud. Very interested in the psychological landscape of his characters. Interested in what it means to live the psychic life. And so much of his poetry, and certainly his, his fiction, is really a, an attempt to try to capture, understand better what's going on in the mind of his characters. The angst, the anxieties, as Freud had much to say about anxiety, the dread that uh, Freud and other important philosophers like Nietzsche had written about. All of that will find its way. But Lawrence seems as well to have, even more than Joyce, a desire to be controversial, to kind of shock his readers. He will write Lady Chatterley's Lover and publish it. It's the first popularized piece of literature that we constitute as pornography. It is an X-rated read, and yet it sells like crazy because it's constituted as literature. But he's pretty controversial in the novels that he writes. We used to do a short story, I mean this kind of tells you how times have changed. We used to do a short story by his called Tickets Please, a story about a guy who works uh, with a whole bunch of, of young girls uh, and uh, it, it, they, they take tickets on the uh, double-decker buses and he's kind of a player and he likes to have conquests, sexual conquests and so he begins a process of trying to sleep with all these different girls and somehow they all kind of find out and so a new girl arrives and they know that he's going to go after them and so they convince the new girl to kind of help them get their revenge and their revenge is to lure him into the woods alone in expectation of another sexual conquest with this new girl and all the women from the uh, from who take the tickets you can see the story tickets please uh, they're all there waiting behind trees so that when he shows up they beat this guy to within an inch of his life and Lawrence will be very graphic in his portrayal of uh, what it, what it, what is it maybe um, you know payback is uh, you know what they say uh, so anyway that's that's the story we used to have that one in our anthologies not anymore that one got pulled and uh, instead, we do this somewhat less controversial, although I'm going to argue this is an extremely controversial story. Uh, let's talk about it. Rocking Horse Winner. Now, there, there are many who argue you can't really do a, a, a D.H. Lawrence text without talking about sex. He's very much consumed with sex. Of course, he will be influenced by Freud. Uh, and, uh, and yet, this, uh, this story has, I think, a whole lot more to it than simply the sexual illusions of uh, any number of topics. If you want to, if you want to kind of, I guess, shock yourself, it, and it will be somewhat shocking, you can do research on this story and be stunned at the interpretations that are sexual in nature in relationship to the story. I'll let you do that on your own time. Let's talk through the story itself. There's a number of ways to read this story in the same way that there's a number of ways to look at cup of tea. One way to think about this story is from its economic perspective. Paul lives in a house that we would constitute, in a family, that we would constitute as upper middle class. Or maybe even upper class. They have bank. They have money. But Mama doesn't feel that they have enough money. And early on, she talks about the fact that they don't have enough money. And, of course, this kind of precipitates all of the negative energy in the family, in the house, and, of course, ultimately her son's death. So one way you can look at this is the socioeconomic question of, of when is there enough? See, go back to my shoe factory story. I told you, when I told you that shoe factory story, I told you we'd reference it a lot. 
Yes, it's sad. Sherman and Anderson lose the job, no doubt. Now, their, their lives are set in a whole different trajectory where Sherman's out trying to find some kind of employment. Uh, of course, Anderson is out finding any kind of money. The family is going to obviously struggle with the fact that financially they're on the rocks, etc. What we often, however, neglect to point out is that in our story, Schreiber is a man of wealth, means. He owns the factory. And yet... Once he has to lay off Sherman and the rest of the guys, there's this subtle worm, virus, that starts to eat in his psyche. In other words, is it possible I could ever lose my factory and therefore my wealth? And what does that mean? What would I do if I lost my wealth? I wouldn't be able to enjoy the lifestyle that I have. All of a sudden, Schreiber has a new anxiety, a new level of anxiety he never had before. He just owned the factory, right? He went to the country club. He had a good time. He did what he did. All of a sudden, in his laying off Sherman, which ironically is so that he can do what? Right? Schreiber lays off Sherman so he can make more money. Right? But ironically, in the process of making more money, it's possible that Schreiber enters a whole new level of economic anxiety. Now, Marx contemporaneously, right, right around the same time as Freud, Marx, right at the end of the 19th century, he's already acutely aware of how the Industrial Revolution is changing radically what's going on in Europe, socioeconomically speaking. So that's one way we can look at this, at this uh, story. For example, we can ask questions like this. What, in your estimation, does it mean to be rich? Okay, what does it mean for you to be rich? So, for example, if I were to say to you, by the age of 30, you say, I want to be rich. What does that mean for you? Do you have a dollar figure? For example, I will know I'm rich when I have a, a million dollars, fluid cash, sitting in the bank. Is that rich? Or will some of you say, no, that's not rich. Rich is for me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And while any number of people can proverbially say, money doesn't make you happy, right? If you've ever met a few people living homeless, most of them will report they are not happy with the fact they're destitute. So there seems to be some relationship between financial security and some level of, right, happiness. What, what will make you happy in regards to wealth? How much do you need? It's an intriguing question. Second way to read this story. It's the socioeconomic read, and of course it sits rather nicely next to, for example, Arthur Miller's Death of a Salesman, a text we looked at last year. And this has to do with the whole dynamic of family. Here, this story gets really disturbing. Because this story seems to suggest, Lawrence, by extrapolation, the author, seems to suggest that parents do things and say things that damage their children, but they don't realize it. Mom doesn't realize how much she's damaging Paul when she says, your dad is an unlucky loser and we don't have money and that's why. She's frustrated. She wishes that the family had more money. She's talking to a little boy. It never occurs to her that Paul will, to use a Freudian phrase, internalize that need. And in the process of internalization, he's going to do what he can do to try to appropriate the necessary funding. Another way to say this is, there's a good chance sooner or later you're going to end up a parent. The statistics seem to suggest it. Question, is it inevitable that you're going to end up damaging your child without realizing it? Without realizing it. You're going to wound your child or children, but you don't know it at the time. You're not going to know it for maybe a long time. In other words, the stuff you say and the stuff you do roots in children's minds. Now we're back to Plato, aren't we? For a long, long time. And then manifests itself in maybe really disturbing ways. Let's look at it from the other perspective. And for some seniors, this is far more disturbing. This story says children are wounded by their parents and they do not know. Children, kids, they do not know. They have no clue. Because for kids, the only environment they know is the environment they're raised in. And granted, by your senior year, you have a little bit of a light picture on the idea that other kids have been raised differently from me, right? I mean, they have a different familial experience from me. 
But most young people are unaware of the ways that they're wounded by their upbringing and their, children, and their parents, what their parents have done, what their parents have said. They don't know until, and now this is the disturbing point, it's too late. Paul is ruined. He's, he dies at the end of the story. Right? He dies at the end of the story. He's got no idea. Of course, he's a very young boy. Adult readers, as you are, of this story will see through the fact Paul doesn't know that he's killing himself to try to appropriate some money for his mother so she will be happy. He doesn't know that. He can't verbalize that. He just recognizes she's unhappy. She wants money. He discovers that when he rides his rocking horse, the names of horses come to mind that are the next winners. And he can bet on those winners and he can make money. Malabar is the last one, the biggest race of them all. He will come to the name Malabar, but in the process of doing that, he's destroyed. His health is ruined, and he dies. As adult readers of the novel or the short story, we recognize, however, that Paul was wounded by his mother. He didn't know he was wounded by his mother. He thought what he was doing was the right thing to do. He had no idea it was the wrong thing to do. Why? Because he loved his mom. He wanted to help her. To what degree, 3B question, is it possible to answer this question? To what degree now, at the age of 18, 19, soon to be 20, two decades is all you've been alive, to what degree are you already aware of the ways you've been wounded by your upbringing? See, Plato will say that's a huge question to ask. You have to ask that question. Remember, you wrote a paper on this topic. If you can't answer that question, you've got no ability to think critically of raising your own children. So you've got to ask the question. Is it possible to answer it, though? See, that's this question of the story. Can you ever really know how you've been wounded by your upbringing until it's too late? When, for example, patterns of behavior begin to manifest themselves. Of course, the blame game will come to mind, and 1147 in the writing assessment that you're going to do, obviously, is playing that game. Who is to blame when kids end up jacked? We're back to Plato again, aren't we? I told you, we end our semester where we began our year, with Plato, asking, who is to blame? Do you blame the mom for saying, we need more money, we ain't got enough money? Even though they've got, obviously, money, they just don't have as much as maybe the person down the road type thing. Do you blame society? A society that has somehow convinced these people that the only success are the people who have lots of wealth? Do you blame the kid for being unable to see beyond his mother's problems? Who do you blame? And what could have been done differently? Is it a socioeconomic issue? Or is it something else? And are all issues in the end reduced to socioeconomics? Are all issues in the end reduced to money, socioeconomics? What do you think? Somebody want to weigh in on that one? In the end, is it all about money? Having it, not having it, having resources, not having resources? Like I told you, a student of mine once said, I never ever knew there was something wrong with me until I showed up at sixth grade and somebody made fun of the shirt I was wearing. For the first time, I, was, I realized, oh, I thought it was cool that I got to wear my sister's hand-me-downs. I didn't realize it was a badge of insult. <sighs> they made fun of me in sixth grade, and from that point on, I was darn determined I was never ever going to live in poverty and I've kind of made all my choices from that perspective because I was raised in poverty she said interesting notice in that situation it's not so much what a parent did to her it's just that it was how she was raised within a, an environment of poverty of course disturbing in this story is Paul ain't poor <laughs> right he's, he's, he's a kid that has money So, what do you want to say about this story? Weigh in on it. Somebody have a comment, an observation. 
kind of a story about greed more than anything. Greed. Define greed. What does it mean to be greedy? Because it seems to me that if greed means wanting more than what you have, isn't that kind of a natural human trait? I have a hundred bucks, I want two hundred bucks. I have a million bucks, I want two million bucks. That's normal, isn't it? I think, isn't it like, like it's one thing to want it, but it's another thing to need it? What about, what's wrong with mom saying there needs to be more money? Do you think she made a mistake saying it out loud to the kid? Yeah. Around the kid. So what does this mean as a parent? You've got to guard all your comments and never say anything around your children? What would Plato say about that, by the way? What's the answer to that from Plato's perspective? You bet you do. You absolutely bet you do. Unless, of course, you want to play the random game of raising children. Say whatever you want. Just like let them listen to it. And then you're, you're dice rolling what they end up like. But if you want to have some sense of what you want them to end up like, then you've got to be very certain what you say, what you don't say in front of your kids. Do you think there's really that lasting an effect? I mean, we had the same question when we talked about, for example, what happens in death of a salesman. A son discovers his dad's having an affair, messing around on the road in Boston, and he totally destroys this life. Totally. Ruins it. You buy that idea? Can kids be that wounded by their upbringing? Really? Or no? What do you think, Miss Katie? Can kids be that wounded, that jacked up by their upbringing, do you think? Or is that an overstatement of the facts? I think they can, depending on what happens. So, as a parent, how do you know whether you're screwing your kid up or not? Like, how do you know? Because we're, we're talking about something that's only going to manifest itself in the future, right? How do you know, Ms. Barney? Like, how do you know if you're going to be a parent? How do you know? Doing this is going to be really good for my kid, but doing this is going to be really bad for my kid. How do you know those things in the future? Well, it's kind of like morals and standards. Having, um... So like the mom just said it off the cuff. Man, I wish we had more money. And that was enough to send Paul off. He could have sworn he heard the house even whispering it. There must be more money. There must be more money. It was innocuous. It wasn't like she was trying to hurt her boy. She just said it. And then he internalizes it, mentally accepts it. I'm going to do whatever I can. Yeah, but she probably got her problem from her parents. Too. It's legacy, Ms. Eve says. We don't have any clue what <laughs> Mama's background was like, but there's a pretty good chance she maybe as well heard something about the importance of money. Was money a topic spoken of in your upbringing and in your house or no? Is it better to talk about it with your kids? Is it better to say to your kid, for example, honey, I can't get that for you, I don't have the money? Or is it better to say to your kid, I'm not getting that for you because I'm choosing not to get that for you, don't ask me why? Which is better, to be honest and say, we don't have the money? Or to not bring economics into it. What do you think is the better way? What do you think, Batson? Is there a better way of the two? Do you tell honestly your kids, we just don't have the money, and then let them kind of live with that reality? Or do you say, no, we're not going to spend our money on that? Granted, we don't have it to spend, but that's how we're going to say it. What do you think is the better way? I would say the second. Don't say to a kid, we don't have the money. Why? That's honest, though. They'll Shouldn't figure we figure it out on their own? Schreiber says it doesn't take a genius kid to figure out. At what point do you think that happens? Is it when you started spending the night at some other kid's house? You're like, whoa. They like have all this crap. I, ne I never even knew exist. Is that? Or do, uh, how, how do they figure it out? How do kids figure it out? Yeah, whenever they enter society, I guess you could say. Because it seems like kindergartners don't care much about that, do they? They don't seem to know, unless, you know, they've really been kind of told about it. They don't know, right? Kids are just kids. They're just kind of dumb kids. Some of you are about to walk right into this for the very first time because you've actually been raised without any sense of socioeconomics 
culture, class. And you're about to arrive, for example, at universities where all of a sudden you're going to meet people who have tremendous wealth. And they actually will define their social negotiations around that. You're a part of the group if you have the money. You're not if you don't. And some of you will be stunned by that. Like, really? You've got to be kidding me. What about luck? Let's go to another topic. This story is ripe for conversations. She says, Mom says, we're just unlucky. That's the reason why we ain't got no cash. We're unlucky. The little boy internalizes that idea as, I want to be lucky. I want to be lucky. Do you believe in luck? That some people are born with... <laughs> You know, special things happen in their life because they are lucky. I remember once a student said, I do not believe in luck. I think it's a complete hoax. And I said, so you'd be the same person if you'd been born under a bridge in Detroit. That's what you're telling me to a crack mama. Because lest I'm mistaken, you weren't and somebody else was. Question, does that make you luckier than them? If you answer no to that, you're, you just haven't seen the world yet. You clearly haven't spent any time with a little child who's a heroin addict at birth. You didn't do anything to not be born under a bridge in Detroit to a crack mama. You didn't do a thing. It just worked out that way. Is that luck? And what about unluck? Do you believe in it? Or do you make your own luck? Or are you dealt cards and then you learn how to play the card game? Being, very, you know, being born under a bridge in South Detroit's one lame card that you get, but we all get cards. And lots of examples of people who start out with nothing who rise to all kinds of success. Question, do you think you're lucky right now? Have you been lucky in your life? Would you call it luck? Or do you call it something else? Is there some kind of destiny? In other words, things are working out in your life the way they're kind of supposed to. Do you believe in that? Like there's this template thing that's happening? And how will you talk about luck when you're talking with your kids? So, for example, your kid tries really hard and loses, sitting in the back of the van, huge alligator tears, and you go, oh, honey, don't worry about it. It's just bad luck. Is that what you're going to say? What will you say when your daughter looks at you through those tears? You're going to say, just bad luck. Are you going to say, the other person was just better than you. It's called life. Grow up. <laughs> Welcome to the world. What are you going to say? How are you going to explain it? And what about things that are way, way beyond your control? Right? I mean, is it bad luck, for example, if this afternoon you go home and everything you own has been torched in a fire? That will happen to some people, right, in America today, won't it? Right? I mean, you show up, your whole house, everything you know is gone. It's all burned up. Is that unlucky? I mean, you didn't do anything. It was just, it happened. How do you define it? Do you define it as luck? And how do you talk about it with kids? Is it a good thing to talk about luck with kids, or is that a bad idea? What do you think, Ramos? Is it a good idea to talk about luck, blame it on luck, or bad luck, or good luck? Because it, cut, it can cut both ways, right? Wow, that was lucky. We got that. You know? Well, I think that when you have luck, you always have unluck, too, because there's always that. There's two sides to that coin. Telling a kid, wow, we got really lucky, is code language for, and someday we won't. <laughs> we might not be so lucky. I think there's luck and there's unluck and all this that you can't manipulate. Life is just what it is. <laughs> yeah. Is that, so I, is that what you tell kids? Life is just what it is. Machiavelli called it fortuna, fortune. And he said, fortune is kind of like a woman that must be subdued with a whip. 
he used a pretty powerful misogynist word picture, didn't he? Remember? <laughs> but basically, he said, fortune happens, bad luck happens, things happen, but the real prince is the one who can kind of control it in some way. Well, enjoy riding your uh, rocking horses.